Well, hello, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. This is a super mini mail call episode, and let's just get right into it. This package here comes from Ian, and Ian is the one who created the Pico Gust card, which I've talked about a bunch of times on the channel. And in here, I already know what this is. This is, there is a no knife, there's no knife in there. <laughs> I can't, I can't open that up. I really need to order some new blades for these, uh, these box cutters. Yeah, as I was saying, Ian is the one who created the Pico Gus card. The Pico Gus card is a software defined card. Well, let's just, let's just open this package and then I can show this off. Yeah, this is the version two of the card. So let's see what's in here. We got a note here. It says, hi, Adrian. Here's the latest Pico Gust 2.0 board. Thank you for featuring the first version on your channel and all of your feedback. The response has been incredible. So the Pico Gust, yes, here it is. All right, so uh, just for a refresher, in case you're not familiar with what this is, the Pico Gust, and darn it, the furnace just turned on. I'll just turn that off. There's a button on my, on my little controller there. So this is the final production version of the Pico Gus card. I mean, not that the first one, uh, the first version, which is this one right here, wasn't being produced. Uh, I stuck that sticker on there, by the way. The difference, obviously, you can tell, this one has all of the components that this thing has on these little boards integrated into it. So if we look at the first one here, essentially what we have going on is we have an RP2050 Raspberry Pi Pico board, and then we have level shifters here that interface it to the five volt ISA bus. And then what you have right here is the digital to audio converter. It's a DAC, and this is a little off the shelf unit that takes the digital output of this, which of course is emulating different sound cards, and then converts it to a very high quality 3.5 millimeter audio output jack. This right here is for MIDI MPU 401 emulation, and you use something like this, which is a little dongle that plugs into that TRS jack here and then outputs a standard MIDI signal. So you can use your Roland MT MT32 and other MIDI devices. So this card is awesome, but obviously the construction required is soldering a bunch of headers on and this, that, and the other thing. And the new version here just takes all of those components like the RP2050 and integrates it directly onto the board. In addition, Ian, after designing this board, came up with firmware that allowed you to use a USB controller as a joystick on a PC. Well, the problem is, of course, is the USB port here requires USB on the go adapter and is a little bit of a pain to use. So on the new version, it just has a very standard USB jack on there. So you can plug your Xbox 360 controller directly into here and actually use that in DOS games. I also noticed instead of a 3D printed slot bracket, this has an actual stamp steel one which is pretty amazing because it fits perfectly. So I guess this one was designed specifically for this board. First one there actually, as you see, has a 3D printed one, which works absolutely fine. But this new board is just pretty darn awesome. Also, I noticed it has an ENG coating here for the connector for the ISA bus, which is far more robust and reliable than the early version here, which has uh, this one here, which I forgot the name of this. It's like solder coated. Um, apparently these can actually shed material and leave it inside your ISA slot. So it's not really ideal. These are much more costly to make these types of boards because it has this gold coating on it. So this still does have a normal USB or micro USB connector on here. And that is for updating the firmware on here. If you break your card, you may need to update the firmware using a computer and you can just plug it into here, which powers up the RP2040. And then you can load firmware onto it by just dragging and dropping. But while this is installed into your PC, you can just plug your joysticks right in there and you don't need to worry about this port. And it's, of course, it's facing down, which is a great design decision. So you can't plug this into an ISA slot and power up the Raspberry Pi Pico uh, multi, multi-processor <laughs> microcontroller. So yeah, I absolutely love this. And there's the DAC there. It is uh, basically just integrated right onto the board. I think it's exactly the same design as this. Although, yeah, I guess it is. Looks like it has the same chips and everything and um, maybe it has these larger caps for better audio quality as well. And you may also notice there's a wavetable header. So it, <laughs> I, I'm literally excited about this project. It's just, it's, it's one of my favorites of 2023 and 2024. I guess I should back up a little bit because I've been gushing about the updates on this 2.0 board. What is this board? Well, obviously it's an ISA sound card and the uh, name Pico Gus kind of gives you the idea that what it does, or what it was originally designed to do, was replace the need for having one of these Gravis ultrasound cards, these extremely expensive cards that are in super high demand for PCs. I don't know what these things cost these days, but it is absolutely ridiculous. 
These are 90 sound cards that had wavetable synthesis. So you had a DRAM that's on the card. Earlier ones actually used SIM slots. And what this thing can do is it can load samples into the RAM there, and then it does hardware wavetable synthesis. So it basically is a synthesizer using samples. Uh, I don't remember how many channels, 32 channels, maybe 64 channels and stereo audio. Not to mention this has the uh, joystick slash MIDI port and this one has sound input and stuff because it's a later version of it. These cards basically bring the capabilities of the Amiga but far beyond because it can use 16-bit samples, stereo audio, and of course way more channels than the Amiga has. And all of that heavy lifting of the synthesis is handled on the card itself. So in the 46 era where people were trying to make awesome demos and games, you could rely on a card like this that to do that sound mixing in hardware. So you were taking the load off your CPU. If you were trying to do like 32 channel playback of digital audio on a 486, a lot of the CPU power would go to doing the sound playback. If you were just using a standard two channel stereo sound card, this card takes the load off. So yeah, lots of games, well not lots, but there's a good number of games that use this. Lots of demos use the Gravis Ultrasound. And they didn't sell that many of them, and therefore, nowadays, they're very expensive. But the Pico Gus card, uh, the 1.0 card here on the left, and of course the new 2.0 card, essentially takes the entire Gravis Ultrasound here and shrinks this down into code that is running on the Raspberry Pi Pico. It does all the mixing, all the interfacing of the ISA bus, the DMA, and all that stuff, and then it outputs that to the DAC, or here, the DAC, and then you get very high quality audio out of your computer. And unlike the DACs that were used on these old cards, which is like the amplifier stuff over here, these cards actually have incredibly good sound quality. I don't remember the exact specifics of these DACs, but it's like 24-bit, um, uh, 96 kilohertz, something like that, and extremely lo low noise. So you're not going to hear buzzing and noise coming through the ISA bus like you did on older sound cards. But this is the killer thing about these cards. Besides the Gravis ultrasound compatibility, which I mentioned, and with my testing and other people have been testing this, it's pretty good. Like, I don't think there's really anything that works on a real Gus that doesn't work on these cards. And things that don't work on these cards when you put a real Gus in the computer don't work as well. The true Gravis ultrasound cards were pretty finicky and with certain motherboards and chipsets had issues occasionally. That is not a problem with these, or, or, sorry, if it's a problem on the real Gus, it's a problem on these as well. That's how good the emulation is. Okay, so that is the headline feature, right? These, as you can see, are open source hardware. And that means that <laughs> you can go to GitHub and you can just download the firmware, you can download the design files, you can make your own cards. Like Ian, Ian completely you know, blew open the market here for the Gravis Ultrasound by, by making this product here available to anyone who wants to, to build one up themselves. Uh, and it's so, so inexpensive. If you look at the building materials here on all the parts, it's, it's really not very much. And of course, there's all the surface mount assembly and then the manufacturing of this uh, stamped steel and the connectors and all that stuff. I think, I can't remember how much Ian is selling these for. He has a Tindy store right now where he sells these. And I think they're, like 70 bucks or something like that assembled, which is really, frankly, a great deal because <laughs> just go to eBay and try to see how much it costs to buy a real Gravis ultrasound like this. It's gonna be hundreds and hundreds of dollars. But besides the Gravis ultrasound compatibility that these cards have and the USB uh, functionality for external joysticks, which of course is awesome as well, the Raspberry Pi Pico, it, it, what's happening here is it cre it's creating a software-defined ISA card. Uh, sound card specifically, right? Because it has the DAC and it has the interface to the ISA bus. That means with new firmware and the firmware is compatible between these two cards, you can change the functionality of these to be other sound cards. And when I first reviewed this card, the available firmwares that were available for this could turn this from a Gravis ultrasound into an ad lib card, into a creative music system card, the CMS card, which is like a square wave 22 channel sound card that Creative Labs made before they made the Sound Blasters. And I think those were the two. Oh no, it could also do Tandy audio. So you could run patched Tandy software on your PC and get that three channel sound. Well, this can emulate that. But yeah, you just run a, a DOS command and you switch to the firmware, say from Gus mode to AdLib mode, and all of a sudden you have an AdLib card and it works exactly like an OPL2 ad-lib card. It's that easy. It's just command lines and you can change it. 
So you can do a couple things. You can set up a couple batch files on your DOS PC, and when you boot your computer, you just type what you want first, like Gravis Ultrasound or AdLib, and it will set this card up on the fly for those types of cards, and then you just run your game, and it works. It is that easy. It is so cool. So with this new design of the card, where everything was moved to the surface mount packages, like right on the board, the idea was that this could be assembled by one of the manufacturers in China much more easily. So that would alleviate the need for a bunch of hand soldering that was required for this one, which Ian is having to do when he uh, ships these out, or what he was. Of course, there's still some hand soldering that has to go on. I think like this uh, wavetable header, for instance, has to be connected and probably the jacks and stuff as well. I bet you the PCB comes with just the surface mount components installed, but I think that simplifies the order process big time. Now, I know I'm jumping around here because I'm really excited about this project because it's just so cool, it's so cool. But one of the other things that Ian just recently released, and we're gonna test that in a second, is new firmware for this that turns it into a Sound Blaster 1.0 card. We already had AdLib emulation, right, for OPL2. Well, what happened, or what the firmware does there, is it takes this card and, of course, it continues with the AdLib OPL2 support, but then it adds the Sound Blaster DSB stuff. And in my testing, and I tested an alpha firmware for, while well, I was testing on this card, because I hadn't opened this package yet, it seemed to work with everything, absolutely perfectly. So it just emulates an original Sound Blaster card, just like that, it just with some software commands, and you just change it, and it's that easy. Now that software has been released, so it's officially out there. So anyone who has one of these already can now run this as a regular Sound Blaster 1.0 card. And Ian let me know that they're working on some additions to turn it into, I think, a Sound Blaster Pro 1.0, which apparently is a super duper rare card. That's like the evolution of the 8-bit Sound Blaster cards that gave you st stereo audio output. And I think the Sound Blaster Pro 1.0 has two OPL2 chips. So that's the FM synthesis chip from Yamaha. And I think there's some games out there that actually support that. So that I think is coming. I don't know the exact timelines on that, but like I said, Sound Blaster 1.0, not the Pro, but the Mono Cards 1.0 support is now out for this. So you could just buy one of these and that's replacing your Gravis Ultrasound, your AdLib card, your Sound Blaster 1.0 card, your Creative CMS card, and of course, it, well, and an MPU 401 card so you can hook up your MIDI stuff because those are super expensive as well. And then, and then uh, other things are possible. So one of the things that Ian was working on, because I was asking him, I was like, is this possible? Is what about SID support for the PC? So that's SID as in Commodore 64 SID sound. There was an official card that came out for the PC that supported SID on the PC. I don't think it ever got traction though, which means that, well, it really, uh, there's nothing no software to use with it. But sure enough, Ian got rudimentary SID support working on this card. There's enough horsepower inside the RP2040 to emulate the SID. And then, uh, yeah, it was actually working. Uh, I don't think that was a finished project because it just had a lot of issues and, uh, well, there's really nothing to use it with. So that, that kind of, you know, went on hold for the Sound Blaster support, which was more important to work on with this card. So I think let me stop gushing about this card and I'm gonna bust out the test bench. We'll hook this thing up and we'll uh, check out that new Sound Blaster 1.0 support, which uh, I have already set up on my 46. Okay, so here is my test bench right now. And as you can see, this 46 motherboard actually has a Sound Blaster 32 in it. So this is like an AW32. I have compact flash card here for booting the system, a local bus video card. And this little ROM card here is the XCIDE ROM that allows me just to, to boot this up without having to worry about the, uh, the BIOS settings on this particular machine. So obviously we don't need this uh, Sound Blaster 32 card anymore because we're gonna be using the Pico Gus instead. Now this of course does do things that the Pico Gus cannot do. So what the Pico Gus can't do right now is there is no OPL3 emulation yet for this. And the main reason for that, according to what Ian was telling me, is that the source code for the, op the open source OPL3 emulation is not optimized enough to run on the RP2040. It's not to say that this couldn't do it. It just means that the code that's available right now needs to be rewritten and optimized to work properly on this particular microcontroller. So of course the Sound Blaster 32 here, besides having also wavetable synthesis with uh, this eight megs of RAM right here, this also supports OPL3. It's inside one of these Creative Labs chips. Some of them can actually have a physical OPL3 chip over here. This one does not. It's emulated inside here. So this does OPL3. This does Wavetable, which is Sound Blaster Wavetable, not compatible with the Gravis Ultrasound. It also is a Sound Blaster 16, so 16-bit 16 sound card. 
And there are a bunch of games that use the Sound Blaster 16 that do not work with the Gravis Ultrasound, which means that the Pico Gus, it cannot emulate a lot of the functionality of this card. But this is really good for older cards. Like I said, Sound Blaster Pro or Sound Blaster 1.0, AdLib, the, um, the Gravis Ultrasound, stuff like that. Stuff that came out before this card came out. Uh, what do we see for dates on this card? 95. Okay, so that's when this thing kind of came out. Look, it says 1995 there as well. I keep this card around. I don't know how much these cards cost, but Sound Blaster 16s are pretty inexpensive, I think, and at least clones are. And if you want OPL3 and stuff like that, you can pick up one of those clone Sound Blaster cards, or of course you can pick up a Sound Blaster 16, or I don't know how much these cost. Um, pick one of these up. But anyways, that's an aside. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug this new version of the Pico Gus into my board here. And yes, it is just an ISA 8-bit slot, which means it does work inside XTs. That is interesting because the original Gravis Ultrasound is a 16-bit card. I don't think it necessarily works in XTs, but this absolutely does. So you can do Gravis Ultrasound stuff on your XT, which is freaking cool, to be honest. Actually, I'm just going to rearrange these so we can... I want to put this over here. That way I want to see the LEDs, the blinky, blinky LEDs that might be on the Pico Gus. So I'll put this front and center in this ISA 8-bit slot so we can see it operating. Yeah. Well, actually, what am I... What am I talking about? It's a top-down camera. You can't see anything operating. All right, there we go. I think we're, uh, you can see the Pico Gus. I know it's blurry right now, but I have this all propped up on stuff. Oh, it's gonna make my face blurry. All right, well, anyways, I think we're good to go. Let's power this on, make sure I don't have anything hooked up wrong. Nope, I think we're good. Okay, we're not seeing anything. Oh, um, I'm on the wrong input, that's why. It should be input two. This is the Extron video scaler that I'm using. I don't know what model this is. Oh, it's a RGB HDMI 300A. And of course we would have a better chance at having video if I actually plug the VGA cable <laughs> into the video card. That would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> Let's see if that did anything. Let's power cycle the computer though. Is this even... Okay, yeah, we're on the right input. Just making sure, just pushing the menu button. Uh-oh. <laughs> What's happening? What happened? Oh, dear. Please stand by. We have technical difficulties. I see the problem. The VJ cable fell off the back of the Xtron. There we go. All right. <laughs> perhaps if I... Perhaps if I actually screwed the cable into the back of the scan converter, that would work better. Okay, so it froze up here and that has nothing to do with the Pico Gus. That has more to do, let's get this back into view here. That has more to do with the fact that the driver is looking for the Sound Blaster 32. It's like a little DOS driver thing I have. It actually is very unhappy if it's not finding the sound card it expects. So what I have to do is just, well, I, what I really need to do is make myself a nice uh, auto exec menu, like one of those DOS menus that I can pick which sound card I want like on the fly because right now I have to just edit this and I have a couple files here. So rem that out and we have Pico Gus and we have Pico Gus Sound Blaster. Those are the two that I have in here. We'll just start with regular Pico Gus mode. Reboot the computer here. Now I have to flash the firmware on this and I haven't done that. And in fact, I probably should go and download the release firmware that Ian just put out literally last night. But the, because the firmware that I'm running on here, I guess, is beta firmware. But it did initialize it. You can see there. So USB joystick support enabled. Wavetable volume set to zero. Gus light card detected at 240. Audio buffer size set to four. You know, blah, blah, blah. You can see that stuff there. So if we go into my sound directory, if I can type correctly, Pico Gus. The utility is called Pico Gus init. And, uh, oh, that just uh, does that. But if we do slash question mark, this allows us to flash the firmware onto this and to change the mode. So slash F and then FW.UF2, that's flashing the actual firmware. So you can do that with a USB cable from your computer. Like that's like the drag and drop method I mentioned. Or of course you can use this software here. So I have a couple of firmwares in here. There's the Pico Gus Sound Blaster FE down at the bottom there, but I also have Tandy, MPU 401 mode, Gus mode, AdLib mode, and CMS mode. 
You can see right off the bat, it initialized the card as a Gravis Ultrasound. So that must be the firmware that's currently loaded on here. So yes, to change the mode of the card, you do have to flash the firmware, but you just do it in DOS here, it just takes a second. And then all you have to do is just edit your auto exec and reboot. In fact, I don't think you even need to do that. You can actually flash the firmware first, and then you can uh, just run the PicoGus init utility, which actually sets it up with like the IO address and all that stuff. So the card currently is set up as a regular Gravis Ultrasound. So I think we, uh, let's see if we have Cubic Player configured to use a Gravis card. I really should make something to help me run this. No, I have this set up to use the Sound Blaster card right now. So we just change this to Gravis Ultrasound. Uh, I think there we go, Wavetable. Oh wait, uh, Wavetable, sample device. Yes, okay, I think this is what we need. So if we run Cubic Player here, there we go, it found the Gravis Ultrasound. Now we can go back a directory to my mods directory. Let's do one that will not get me copyright flagged. How about this one? I'm blocking my face so it focuses on the, the, the Gus card there and you see the LED blinking? It's basically telling us that it's actually working. So yeah, and what's really awesome right here is that it, well, I mean, it's a Gravis ultrasound, right? That's what it's working as. So with Cubic Player here, for instance, all of the heavy lifting of all the mixing of these channels, you can see there's at least like 24 channels here happening, is all happening in the card. And what happened in real Gravis ultrasound as well, that means that if you, I don't think you can run this program on a non 386, Cubic Player I think requires a 386, but if you say ran this on a really slow 386SX at 16 megahertz, this would have no trouble playing this file. A 386SX at 16 megahertz is, is not really much faster than a 286 at that same speed, or if it is the same speed really, or maybe even slower. That means that, yeah, you can absolutely use some really old 386 machines. In fact, I think if you took something like an XT or a 5150 and you put a 386 accelerator card in there, like an above board or inboard or whatever it's called, then you put this in there, then you could absolutely play these high number of channel files on an XT or a 5150, like to totally wild. And that's all because the heavy lifting is done in the card, right? I think if you're into sound cards at all on the PC, you pretty much know how that works and stuff. I just, I just think it's very cool. Okay, so we're back in the Pico Gus directory and all we need to do is Pico Gus init slash F and then we're gonna switch this over to this, the new Sound Blaster mode. So we just do this and this is it. Now. In my old video on this, I think I might have mentioned I ran into some issues on certain motherboards flashing firmware on this, but I have to tell you that uh, Ian has fixed all of those issues. So this card is rock solid and works so freaking well. So we are now in Sound Blaster mode. Now the thing is, of course, is that the system has like the ultrasound variable still set up and whatnot, which is not really appropriate. So we're gonna edit my auto exec bat here and we're just gonna switch this go to command from Pico Gus to Pico Gus Sound Blaster. And now if we reboot the system, what's gonna happen because the firmware is already on here for Sound Blaster is that it will just set up the blaster variable and initialize the card as a Sound Blaster card. Now you don't need to tell the Pico Gus init utility what firmware is on the card because it just looks at the card and figures out, oh, you're running Sound Blaster firmware and it sets it up as a Sound Blaster. But you do need to have your blaster uh, set blaster in the auto exec first so that it knows how to set up the card. So if we look at the set here, you can see I have set blaster A220 I5 D1, so interrupt five DMA channel one. The PicoGus utility will look at the blaster variable and then set the card up appropriately. Well, it might well be that Cubic Player does not support Sound Blaster 1.0 cards. Yeah, I hit pause. It says Sound Blaster not found. Optimize your CP.ini. Okay, well, we're not gonna be able to use Cubic Player for testing, but I'm pretty sure we can use Freddy's Modmaster XT. Let's see, here it is, mod master, oh, and maybe we need to edit the config file, mod mxt.cfg. Um, okay, I'm not gonna touch that. I don't know what's going on there. There we go, Sound Blaster 2 found. Oh, so it emulates Sound Blaster 2. Sorry, I said Sound Blaster 1 earlier. That was obviously incorrect. And this is a mod player that can play mods on an XT. Well, it's super highly optimized. Okay, let's try a four channel mod file here from the Amiga days.
Yeah, so this sounds this sounds really good. Now the Sound Blaster 2.0 card is a mono 8-bit sound card, so that's all you're gonna get. And this is currently running at 16 kilohertz at 8-bit mode. I'm sure I could raise the sample rate because this machine is fast enough for that. Um, notice the LED is not blinking, and that is because I think it blinks not for DSP activity, which is what's happening here in this core, but for any of the OPL2 activity. So if we run a game that uses OPL2, the LED will blink. So just keep that in mind if you're worried about it, you know, it not actually working, because obviously we have working Sound Blaster support right here. We can run Doom setup here. So music card, we'll just pick Sound Blaster 220, Sound Effects card, Sound Blaster 220, IRQ5, DMA1. Remember, that's how I had my blaster variable set up. And the number of channel, this is software mixing that, that Doom does. And um, let's start the game. Takes a bit of time to load because I have a 16 bit ISA controller here for. Obviously, as you can hear, it's working perfectly. So I played around with the firmware, this new firmware on my 1.1 card, and it freaking worked absolutely perfectly. So there, you just heard the sound. It sounds, well, honestly, it sounds better than any old Sound Blaster card I ever listened to because the original Sound Blaster 2.0 card was noisy as, like the audio output on the thing, you'd hear all this ISA bus activity and stuff like that. That is not the case with the Pico Gus cards. They work really well and they offer a really nice and quiet sound output. So if you're interested in getting a Pico Gus, I think one of the issues before is that Ian really couldn't keep up. Oh, it's only $45. That's right. He couldn't keep up with the demand. And as you can see, it's out of stock right now on his Tindy store. And I know Ian is currently working on a big batch of them. And you can see like the stack of cards right here. So if you have some that you've already ordered from the Tindy store, Ian lets me, uh, let me know that they are in progress and hopefully you should get your card soon. But to alleviate the constant shortage that this card is under, Ian has been working with Joe over at Joe's Computer Museum. And if you saw my video, I don't know where it is right now, on the Blue Scuzzy 2.0, the one that uses also a Raspberry Pi 2040 chip, Joe is going to be selling these cards and assembling them. And that means there's gonna be a nice, constant, easy to get source of those cards here in North America through Joe's Computer Museum. I don't know when it's gonna all be ready and Joe's gonna have them on his website for sale, but hopefully in the next few weeks they will be. So maybe when the time this, come, this video comes out, you'll be able to order those cards directly from Joe's website. But I mean, $45? I was thinking it was gonna be $75. And to be honest, even at that price, it's a deal. But the fact is, for $45, you get a Gravitz Ultrasound, a Sound Blaster 2.0, all these other sound cards, and possible future stuff. It's just absolutely mind blowing. I'm not sure what they're gonna cost on Joe's website, but you know, maybe they'll be at a similar price or whatnot. But even if they're a bit more, like I said, it's totally worth it. Ian also let me know, and let me switch inputs here off of there. Ian also let me know that he is working with someone in Europe to try to get a distributor happening over there where they're gonna be assembled and distributed over there. So hopefully that'll happen soon. That way um, the folks in the rest of the world are gonna be able to order these a little bit more easily than importing them from the US and having to pay duty and all that kind of stuff. In addition, it goes without saying, as I mentioned earlier, this is an open source project. So if you want to build one yourself, you can absolutely do that. There's a few different versions of the hardware. Uh, there's a version for the Hand 386. Uh, there's no picture here. But what that is, that little portable computer that is from AliExpress or whatever. And there's a version of this that plugs into the side of that and have the expansion header. I think it would also work on the Book 8088 as well. Yeah, like this is all right here available for you to do. Oh, look, there's me testing uh, testing this card, the earlier version, and plus some other ones as well. I think uh, this is Joel here in Portland who tested this one. So yeah, this is just, you could probably tell by my excitement. I freaking love this project. 
And this right here is the community at its best, right? Open source hardware, open source software, making this stuff easily accessible to everyone, taking away the fact that you have to be kind of wealthy to own a Gravis Ultrasound, and now that is no longer the case. I mean, I know you're not getting the real card, the original card, but you're getting access to the capabilities of the Gravis Ultrasound with simply an inexpensive card like this, and it's open source. I mean, like, what else could be better about that? That is just amazing. So a huge thanks to Ian and everyone else who worked on this project. In fact, let's just switch to the bench cam here because uh, there's a little list of people on the back. And what's even cool is Ian was so kind to even put my name on the back because I just help with some of the testing and stuff. But like compared to some of these other folks who did so much more work on this card, I'm just a little small potato in that world. But just look at this card. It is so freaking awesome. And I absolutely positively love it. I guess you do have to set a jumper, by the way, for your blaster to match. Uh, it's like the blaster variable. So I had this on five and one already, so it just worked, I guess. Uh, Gravis Ultrasound also uses, I think, an IRQ and a DMA as well. So I must just have it configured appropriately. So just keep in mind, I think the blaster variable is used for the base IO, which is software definable, but these are not. So anyways, so anyhow, that is it. I'm going to stop gushing about this. I'm sure people who aren't interested in this are probably sick of me talking about it, but yeah, I just can't get enough of how awesome this is. Thanks, Ian, for working on this and everyone else who helped with this project. And thank you for sending me this card. And now I have the other one as well. And I think the other one, the third one I have, the original 1.0 card is inside my lab build game machine I have back there. So yeah, this, this, this is just amazing. I, I, this card will live in my stash of cards back there because it's so universally capable that it's just so easy to pop this into whatever system I'm testing if I need a sound card versus trying to fiddle around with an original Sound Blaster 2.0, which I luckily have one of those, or a Gravis Ultrasound, which I luckily have as well. I'd just rather use this. It's just so much easier and so much more capable and awesome, 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 awesome. Okay, on to the next item. I have a lot of stuff to cover with Mail Call, so I'm just gonna grab another package. Or I'm gonna clear this stuff off and let's grab another package. All right, the next package here, well, uh, I can't tell who it's from or where it's from because the P.O. Box sticker is covering the, the from label. But luckily we have a letter inside and oh, a couple chocolates as well. Let's see what the letter says. The letter reads, Dear Adrian, I recently purchased an Apple IIe that came with an expansion board with only one meg of RAM populated. I ordered more RAM chips to fully populate the card to a full eight megs. This unfortunately was around 30 ICs. I had no way to test them before installing them, so I purchased two DRAM testers, one for me and one I sent to you. I don't believe you have one of these, and since you do lots of retro computer repairs, that should help you speed things up. I got these from eBay, which I will include a link in the email. The Rev6 has six or three ZIF sockets and the Rev2 only works with 80 to 20 pin DRAM. I have emailed the PDFs to you before you get this package. You should help explain it all. Be sure you don't go over five volts. It has all the circuits on board to make the plus 12 and minus five volts. That would be for 4116 chips. And yes, the old micro USB connector, I think he did that intentionally as to prevent giving this too much power. Thanks in advance, Mark from Arkansas. Thank you very much, Mark. And hi to all my Arkansas viewers. Let's see what we got here. All right, we got a little few chocolates. Thank you very much for that, Mark. That's pretty awesome. And I think we have the tester here. So indeed, Mark was right. I don't have any kind of DRAM testers specifically. Now, I have the Retro Chip Tester Pro, and uh, that is that thing that I've shown on the channel a bunch of times, and that can test pretty much all the DRAMs, but it's big and I don't usually have it sitting out and handy. I have to kind of go grab it and set it up and stuff to use it. Something like this is so small that it can just sit here right on the bench. So getting these two out of the bag here, looks like we have two different testers. Let's zoom in a little bit for maximum magnification. So looking at this one on the left here, it looks like we have an STM32 microcontroller. There's the micro USB connector and the ZIF socket. And there's a little marker uh, spot there to tell you where pin one is for the IC. I'm assuming we push the button to test. And I guess, uh, well, that's probably a multicolor LED right there, that little white package, which will tell you if the chip is good or bad. And on the back here, it says four bit DRAM tester, uh, copyright 2002, Simon Raybold. And it also says made in England. 
months. Kind of cool. So with 4-bit tester, by the way, this is for 4464 DRAMs or 4416s, which are used on the Commodore 64 short boards, for instance. And then this one right here, let's look on the back here. It says 1-bit DRAM tester Rev 6, also from the same person, Simon, made in England as well. And the 1-bit chips are the typical 4116s, 4164s. There's 1 megabit variants as well. And we can see right there that this is the version, or this is the socket here for the 4116, which requires these extra bias voltages right there. And this will have some kind of DC to DC converters on board here to take that five volts USB connection here and give you the, uh, the right voltages on that chip. 4164s only need five volts and same with the uh, one megabit 256 kilobit variants, which I think go into probably that socket for the one meg one and that one for the 64s. Now, if you put a 4164 in the wrong socket, danger zone, it would definitely kill that chip immediately. And supposedly putting the chip that needs these bias voltages into a socket that does not have it, theoretically can damage it. This is what I've heard, never tested it. I didn't want to potentially ruin one of those chips. It's not like they're super common anymore. So for testing, let's grab some stuff here. I just had this little bit of foam handy on the side of the bench. These are four bit chips. So that would mean they would go into this one right here. And these are 4164. So that will go into this socket. And this right here is a 4116, I think. Let me put on my magnifier. So yeah, 4116. So that one will go into this socket here with those extra voltage rails. So let me grab a power supply so we can power this thing up and try it out. All right, let's start with this one here. So this is plugged into my computer uh, to give it five volts. Ah, look at that, some multicolor LED action going on there. It's um, kind of washed out, but colors are very vibrant to my eyes. The camera, strangely enough, doesn't really show those very well. All right, we'll start with the 4116 here. My assumption, uh, interesting is I don't see the pin one indicator. I'm assuming it's going to be up there. Let's pop this in. And just to double check before I hit the test button, that has a square pad. The rest of these are round and that does indicate that pin one is there. Top left corner. I'm just going to grab a marker here and we'll put a little dot there on all of these just to help identify. There we go. Okay. Let's push the button. I don't see any switches or anything, so I'm assuming it's just auto detect. Testing, 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 testing. Lights are blinking. And we got blue. I guess I gotta go read the documentation. <laughs> okay, I was able to find the email from Mark and I found the two PDFs that were attached. Well, it seems pretty comprehensive being able to test pretty much all the chips, including the 1024 kilobit chips, which I guess are what, TMS, what are they, 41 1000s or something like that, the part number? I can never, I never keep track of the part number, but the 41256 are 256 kilobit chips. So eight of those DRAM chips gives you 256 kilobytes, one bit each. I think those are used on, for instance, Amiga 500s and 2000 motherboards, the earlier versions that have eight chips. Well, they have 16 chips for 512K, which is using those 41256s. It looks like it can do some interesting stuff as well. Like it can test the half chips, like the 4108, which are partially failed 16 kilobit parts, or also the TMS 4532s or the Oki 3732s, which are half failed 64K parts. Those were used in the ZX Spectrum, I'm pretty sure. They essentially were sold with half of the chip knowingly bad, and basically when the ZX Spectrum uses them, they're either bad in the top half or the lower half, and the computer can, I think there's a little way to select is which, which half of the chip is used on the motherboard, and it was a way for Sinclair to get those chips much cheaper. It also supports the 128 kilobit parts that were two 64 kilobit chips piggybacked together. Pretty sure the IBM 5150, the early revisions of the motherboard, or sorry, 5170, the 286 AT motherboard uses those. And I have some in mind and I've never really been able to test those. They essentially stack these two chips together. Everything is soldered together. And there are two RAS lines as mentioned right here uh, that kind of go down all the way through to the motherboard. And that's how it's able to address those. So on the 5170 that has these chips, eight chips is 128 kilobits and it has four banks of that for a total of 512K on the motherboard. And you cannot just replace them with normal chips. You won't be able to get that capacity. I think you'd have to stack two 64K chips together and bend a pin and cut a lower pin and kind of do a little bit of hackery to make that work. 
Scrolling through the document, we have a little bit on the LEDs. So that was the power up configuration, those colors. And here it says the tester detects the rows and columns and splits them into two halves, unless uh, using smaller than 16 kilobit chips. The lower half rows are shown in the upper LEDs and the upper half are shown in the lower LEDs. The lower half columns are shown in the left LEDs and the upper half in the right LEDs. So the chip we just put in there is 16 kilobit, it's a 4116, and therefore it uses four kilobit blocks and there should be four of them. So we should have four blue LEDs, right, for the upper and lower halves. Blocks not detected do not illuminate the LED. Blocks that pass at high speed but then fail a retention time test will flash. The indicators that the part may work, but the DRAM is out of spec. Parts with the capacity up to 16 kilobits, like the 4016, should light up like this. Missing blocks do not light the corresponding LED. Parts with capacity over 16 kilobits, up to 64, will use green. So a regular DRAM chip for this Commodore 64, uh, 4164 should light up four green LEDs. That means four 16 kilobit blocks. And then the 256 kilobit chips, like in the Amiga, we get four purple blocks or whatever magenta, and then we get cyan for the one megabit chips. All right, and when we look at this, hopefully it shows up with the camera, you have only two LEDs on the side, which is telling us that this chip did not test correctly. Very interesting. It's telling us that it's actually only testing um, as an eight kilobit chip, so half bad. Let me take it in and out of the socket, put that back in. I'm gonna hold it down, push the button. It does test pretty quickly, which is pretty cool. Yeah, same thing. Very interesting. I guess I'm gonna have to get the Retro Chip Tester Pro and we'll use that, see if this, this little chip is working. Okay, well, let's try one of these regular 64 kilobit chips here. These are the ones for the Commodore 64. So like that and we push the button, it's in the right socket here, that way it's not giving it the higher voltages that it doesn't need. This is gonna take much longer to test, up to uh, four times longer, of course, and we should get, what, I think the uh, green, four green LEDs. So let that sit for a second here. Oh yeah, here it is right here. So, yep, TMS 4164 shows all green. If you're using one of those half size, sorry, I just got a message on my phone. If you're getting one of those half chips, where it's like upper half, lower half, wow, this is a Pretty cool way to do the testing. It shows up like that. Very cool. All right, well, we got all green light lights, which tells us this chip is good. I'm gonna get a little marker here. Um, this is a, an MT RAM chip too, which you know how, how good those are. They're not, I'm kidding. This is a pretty handy tester, I really have to admit. All right, so looking at my little foam pad here, these are all 256 kilobit chips here that are on the board. These are the four bit wide version that need the other tester. And then I went and I found two more of these 4116, so 16 kilobit chips, like the one we just tested that did not work. So why don't we try this? This already has a check mark on it, so it looks like I've already tested this and found it to be okay. So we'll test this one here, see what happens. See if it replicates uh, what I already found. No, uh, there must be a fault on this board. I'm positive the, this chip is good here. I would not put a tick mark on it if it didn't test good in real hardware. My feeling is there's probably a bad connection on this board or something that's causing it to uh, not be able to test all the pins. Oh, it worked that time. Well, that's not reassuring. Let's try that again. I just sort of poked on the bottom side. Oh, look, and there did that again. Why don't I, um, I don't know, push down on this? Maybe it's a dodgy ZIF socket. Let's go back to this one we tested first. Oh, you know, the pins are, oh, they don't look so good. Okay, so maybe I, maybe this is not the you know fault of the tester. It's just dodgy pins. In other words, I need to clean them a little bit, use some sandpaper on them or whatever. Hmm. All right, let's try this one. Oh yeah, this one has very corroded pins. It does have a tick mark on it. Well, let's just give this a try. It might well be that these ZIF sockets, if they're not the, the real deal, they can be a little sketchy, I find. Okay, so that's uh, four blue LEDs. So that one tests good. And the other one tested good. So we're getting the four blue LEDs there. And for the one that's not testing correctly, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this into a socket here. Let's see if I can get this into a socket. These, this is a really expensive gold plated socket. So we'll put this into the ZIF socket. <laughs> Let's see what happens now. Let's see if this tests good now. 
Nope, still testing bad. Very interesting. Okay, well anyways, let's just test quickly one of the 64 kilobit chips here that I had that uh, has a tick mark on it already. Oh no, this one doesn't actually. So let's see what happens. And that one tested good. We have four green lights. So that gets a tick mark. And this one here, I've already tested previously, but we'll just run that again. Uh-oh, unhappy with that one. And this one's a 5290. This one actually might be a 16 kilobit chip, and I might've put it in the wrong socket there. All right, without a doubt, this is a 4116, so this needs to go in this socket right here. So I guess we just figured out if you power one with uh, the wrong voltage, five volts, does that cause damage? Let's see. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> I mean, I've read that, that it can, but I don't really believe it, to be honest. Oh no, that one tests good still. Okay, so <laughs> we have a good chip. So all we have that's not really testing correctly is this one right here, which is still in the socket here. I went and grabbed the Retro Chip Tester Pro, which is right here, it's a lot bigger. The reason why that you might wanna get a tester like this is I'm sure, sure that it's actually quite a bit cheaper than the Retro Chip Tester Pro, which is a pretty costly test device. It's extremely capable though, but it's expensive. So that is the negative about it. We can put this chip in here. I'll just leave it in the little socket. And this is gonna do the test. Now, this has some really comprehensive RAM tests on it. Things like March testing, random number generation, you can configure the RAM tests that run in this. This is an older firmware, I bet you there's some better firmware. Yeah, this chip is working perfectly in, in the Retro Chip Tester Pro. Now it's doing a March test right now, which is, uh, there's two different ones, a U and a Y. Yeah, so this chip is fully working in the Retro Chip Tester Pro, and yet for whatever reason, it does not work properly in this tester. Now, the thing is, it's, neither of these are actually great for testing TTL devices. And the reason why is in the case of the Retro Chip Tester Pro, let's just test this again here. This is using an Atmel CMOS-based microprocessor or microcontroller. And that means the levels that it's driving the chips at are not super accurate. Like it's not the same as a TTL stuff. So things can show as failed in here, but actually work in a real TTL machine, that's because the threshold levels are very different and vice versa. I've had stuff that doesn't work in a real TTL thing and this thing says it's good. It's not that there's something wrong with this or the algorithms are bad. It's that driving TTL chips with CMOS stuff works most of the time, but it doesn't work always in those threshold situations. And I'm sure this tester that Mark just sent in, I gotta try to see what kind of chip it is. I can't quite make it out. It looks like it's an ST microcontroller part of some type. But anyways, it's probably doing the same thing and it's gonna be driving this RAM with CMOS thresholds. And there's just no way around that, unfortunately. And that's, that's gonna mean that it's gonna say stuff is bad, like this chip, but I'm pretty sure that this chip is totally fine in a real TTL-based computer as well. Cause I had it sitting off to the side here while well, stuck into this foam and it worked. So just know that these types of testers are not, like what's the right word? They're not the end all in be all. The only way you could really know 100% for sure about the whether one of these chips is good or bad, you'd need to design a chip tester that used, say, a 6502 or a Z80 and one of the NMOS versions of the chip, not the later CMOS versions, because those are going to have similar issues to this. If you go look up the differences between the CMOS threshold levels and TTL, there's quite a substantial difference. And when you're using 74LS parts, the the old LS parts are TTL chips, and there are newer versions that are not TTL logic, but they are TTL compatible. And I think those are called like ACT and HCT, like the T part is the TTL part, but the HC parts, like 74HC, are purely CMOS-based chips and don't always work properly in old computers. And that's because again of those, those threshold levels. So I've run into plenty of situations where the Retro Chip Tester Pro here you know, said something was bad, like RAM chips, for instance, and then I put it into a real computer and it works perfectly. And my only assumption is the output drivers on those DRAM chips that it said were bad are probably outputting like a lower level than expected, but anything over like 0.8 volts or, or one volt on TTL shows up as high and generally works. It's kind of one of the reasons why you can take a 3.3 volt part, like a microcontroller, and stick it on a TTL bus, and the TTL bus is completely happy with that because those 3.3 volt high signals for TTL just show up as high, 
And ultimately, as long as that microcontroller can tolerate five volts going into its input and doesn't damage it, then it works as well. If you are an experienced electrical engineer, especially from back in the 80s when you worked on this stuff a lot, and you can talk more about this, I'd love to hear about that more in the comments for other people to read about it. But for now, um, oh, this cable is kind of annoying. It's in front of the camera. I'm not gonna be condemning this particular chip because this is saying it's bad. I believe this chip is totally working. And the only way for me to really test this would be to install it in something like my TRS-80 and then run my March ROM test ROM that's available on my GitHub repo that my friend David did for me um, with this chip in there. And I'm pretty sure this chip is totally good. So I'm just gonna leave this on the foam pad for in the future when I need a 4016 chip. But what we can do next is let's grab one of these 256 kilobit chips here to make sure this socket doesn't get bent. And we'll put one of these on here. Let's see what happens here. So that goes into the same socket as the 64 kilobit chip. Push the button, and this is gonna definitely take a much longer time to test. So while we wait, I'm gonna eat one of these chocolates. Yes, I had lunch a little while ago, but this is a nice little extra dessert snack. Okay, so I was about to go talk about the RAM testing on this device, but it finished testing that chip, and it did take quite a while, but that's just how it goes. And it did test good. So I'm just gonna stick the next one in. I haven't actually gone through and tested these, so we may as well may as well do that now. So according to the PDF here, just further down, this is the RAM test procedure. So it measures the size of the RAM, probably does some like reading and writing to the various blocks. And if you're trying to write to a smaller DRAM, to treating it as a larger one, you're gonna get repeating mirrors basically. So you can detect the size pretty easily there. So it does some high speed tests where it fills the RAM with zeros and ones, checks it. It does an even hash test, an odd hash test, fills it with random data, and then checks that and repeats the above test several times. So it doesn't do a March test. It's possible there are gonna be some errors that it does not detect properly. Filling it with zeros and ones, that just checks for stuck, stuck bits, doesn't really, doesn't really give you anything. The random data is decent. It says that it repeats the random test several times. So hopefully that means that it's gonna it's gonna figure out that there's a bad bit. Now I'm no electrical engineer or chip designer, but from my understanding, simply doing a March test is literally one of the best RAM tests you can do. And it identifies pretty much all the issues. It's a bit slow. So quickly doing a pass where you're just filling it with zeros and ones and simple patterns can be a quick way to identify a good number of issues. But ultimately the, the March test is the, the best one. And it's really gonna detect all of the issues like stuck bits and bit flips that happen with adjacent bits and anything else that, that's going wrong with the chip. I think a random test when you run it enough times probably is similar effectiveness to a March test, but I think there are some situations where the random test actually may miss stuff. And that just is because it's random or pseudo random data, which means that particular patterns that you're writing to the RAM may not cause the bit flip to happen somewhere else in the memory and you might not be able to detect it. So since the Retro Chip Tester Pro does do March testing, that means that you know, it's pretty much gonna be one of the best non-computer ways to detect bad memory. This one, unfortunately, doesn't do that. It'd be nice if it did implement that. I doubt there's any way to update the firmware on this anyway, so that's probably uh, no chance of this implementing that in the future. Okay, well, I tested a couple of these 256 kilobit chips, and that worked perfectly. So let's switch over to the other tester and try testing one of those four bit chips like the ones from the short board. And this chip is a 41464. And that kind of tells you that that four in front of the 64 means it's a four bit chip. The pins are a little oxidized. I'll pop this in here, make sure we align it to the top here where that little notch is. I guess that's the right way to do it. And we push the button and it's blinking. Now, when it comes to duration of testing, oh, we have a green light there and it's washed out looking, but it is a bright green. I was gonna say the duration of this is gonna be about four times the duration of a regular one bit 64K chip, but I don't know, maybe it's optimized in certain ways, but I'm assuming that is a good result. We can check out the PDF here. So this is the revision two, and it's good for the 4464s, which is what we're testing here. I mean, it's marked as a 4164, which actually is that part number right there but it also works with the 44256s and the one megabit chips, well, one megabit times four, and the 16 kilobit versions. The 4416 is the video RAM chip on the Commodore 128, if I recall, the stock 128. And you can upgrade those to 4464s to 
uh, increase the RAM capacity or the video RAM capacity of your 64 or 64, your 128 from 16K all the way to 64. And there's some testing time. One megabit times four is about six minutes versus the one we just did, which is about 24 seconds. And it looks like the RAM test is exactly the same. So random multiple times and filling it with zeros and ones. So thank you very much, Mark, again, for sending these in. I don't have links on where you can buy this, but I'm assuming you just go to eBay, type in DRAM tester and look for boards that look just like this. And you can pick some up if you'd like. Thanks again, Mark, for sending these into the basement, though. I do really appreciate it. Okay, I'm gonna do one more package. Hopefully it's not super depth and involved because this video is getting kind of long, but boy, I'm, I'm really behind on my mail call. There are so many things piled up here that I, uh, I, need to, I need to get ahead of that. So this comes from Dwin in Virginia. Hi to all my Virginia viewers. Inside we have a little wrapped package and a letter. Let's take a look at the letter. All right, I folded up this letter to preserve some privacy, but Dwin says, I purchased some used Mac SEs about a year ago. One of them included this Micro Mac accelerator board. What? I think this card was designed for the Mac Plus. It was installed in one of the Mac SEs. However, we uh, why have a processor clip when there is a processor direct slot? Yeah, exactly. So on the SC, there's actually a PDS slot, so you can plug into that, but with the Mac Plus, you have to plug right on top of the 68,000. So I don't have any plans to purchase a vintage Mac Plus, so I thought you might could do something with this card. Way back in the 1980s, I used to work for a company in, I think it's Gaithersburg, Maryland, called Mac Corner, the only Macintosh store. We used to carry all the third-party upgrades for the Mac, and we were not an authorized Apple reseller, so we worked in the gray market. I love it. By the way, thank you for your YouTube video about the Mini Mac Repair-a-thon. As you said in the video, to get rid of those Vartan or Varian battery on the motherboard because it will leak and destroy said motherboards. So I immediately removed the battery from the motherboard and replaced it with a battery holder and replaced the battery. So now the date time clock works. Yeah, that's awesome. So have fun with the board and look forward to your next video. Thanks very much, Dwin. Let's see what this is all about. So Micro Mac, it's funny because I've been talking to some people about Micro Mac stuff lately. If you look on the internet and you look for Macintosh accelerator cards, you will find the website for Micro Mac still listing a bunch of cards and for low prices. And I think it fools a lot of people because they look at that and they think, oh, you could still buy these Mac SE or Mac Plus accelerator cards for very low amounts of money. We're talking like, you know, $100 or whatever it is. But I don't think that's the case. I think these, <laughs> that website is not actually, you know, valid anymore. It's just an old website that's still on the internet. Sorry, there's a lot of tape here and I'm talking while cutting. Yeah, so when you look at the like, you know, order now part of that website, it's like an old web form. It's not even HTTPS, it's not using SSL or any kind of encryption and you just type in your credit card number into a text box. Like, yeah, I don't think so. So it's unfortunate. I mean, it's, it's cool in a way it's preserved, but it's also unfortunate that it tricks a lot of people into thinking that there is a way to get these cheap Macintosh accelerators. I just think it's kind of hilarious in a way that I just literally the other day, I think like two days ago, was talking about the Micro Mac website. And uh, here is one of the cards. Oh, look, and it is, oh, it's fascinating. I've never seen one uh, in person. So it has the space for the PDS slot, but this has the clip to go on top of the 68,000 processor. And these clips, unfortunately, are completely unobtainable now. So they allow you to plug this right on top of the chip without having to desolder the, the chip from the board or anything like that, because this has little like notches on the side here that actually bend and go around the processor itself. But there's no reason why an accelerator for the Mac SE and the Mac Plus, like, oh, oh sorry, why one for the Mac Plus wouldn't work on a Mac SE. And it just might be, it might be easier. And it says SE Plus and Classic. So it even supports the classic. So this is, oh, you know, I might need to try that. Wow. I'm wondering if like the code in the PALS is different depending on which system you're using it on. But you see this right here? Basically, if you uh, take a, a PLCC socket and solder that into this spot, then you could push this onto a classic and then you could upgrade your classic. So there's room for a 68882 which is the math code processor. And we have a 68030 at 16 megahertz, 1984 assembled in the USA, the performer. Yep, we got some gals here. So pals or gals, this is the, the logic that makes this thing work. 
And then of course, you just stick this on top of the processor and you got an accelerated machine. Looks like this thing had a capacitor on it, had a little surface mount cap that was ripped off at some point. So I'm gonna need to replace that. But I don't notice any other damage to this. And what this is right here is for the power connector. And I guess, depending on whether you're using a, an SE, a Classic or Mac Plus, that's in the right spot to allow the power connector to fit through. Nothing on the bottom. What an awesome, simple little accelerator. It's really a shame in a way that there's nothing like this. Like someone couldn't replicate this board for those machines and allow us to, to really speed up those systems. Now it has a 25 megahertz crystal on here, which could mean that this thing actually runs this, overclocks this to 25 megahertz, or that could be divided by two and we end up at like 12 and a half megahertz for this 16 meg chip. Not too sure about that. So I do wanna test this, but this is just a super mini mail call episode. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth. And if this is not working when we plug it into the board, then I guess uh, there'll be a repair video maybe at some point in the future. So I'm gonna do a jump cut real quick and I'm just gonna replace that cap that's missing. And then um, I'll find a computer and we can try this out. Okay, new cap is installed. I also found one of the pins on the CPU was bent over and touching uh, one of the other pins. So I just used a magnifying glass and a knife and I just sort of carefully bent that back. So none of the pins on there are shorting. And I gave it a quick once over on all the other components here. Everything else looks completely fine. All right, so I grabbed a Macintosh SE. I'm trying to get into camera view here. And I put the motherboard in here that said it worked and this chassis had no motherboard in it. Let's see if this works. The accelerator is not installed in here. I don't have a Macintosh Plus handy. I had one that I recently repaired, but someone else has that machine right now. So I don't have a, handy, a Plus handy that's taken apart or whatever. And what are we getting there? It looks like we're getting good display. I just want to see the flashing disc. Question mark. Okay, yeah, so the rolling bar is the camera. This uh, camera on my bench here is not set up for a locked frame rate. I think this thing has four megs of RAM. Are we working? And unfortunately I don't have like an easy way to hook up the RGB to HDMI to a Mac SE. Like I have my Mac Classic that has the modified power supply that allows us to easily connect that up. But yeah, okay, good. So this one appears to be working. So let's get this motherboard out of here and I will connect up the Micro Mac accelerator to the, to the Mac SE. So one of the things about these Micro Mac accelerators that kind of sucks, to be honest, is that they are, they do not have any memory on them. That means that you're accessing all the RAM uh, over 16-bit data bus. You're not getting the, the benefit of fast 32-bit memory. There's also no cache memory on here. There's nothing really to speed this thing up. So if you had the, the right connector to go onto here and I don't have one, maybe I can find one and solder that on. That would put the accelerator kind of right about here. Now the power connector on the SE motherboard, as you can see, is not even anywhere near that one. I'm assuming that's for the Mac Classic motherboards. And then obviously if we plug it right into here, how does that work? Does that fit with the RAM? Because it seems like this is really close to the memory. Oh, you know what? I need to make sure that we're hooking up the correct way. Where's the notch? Well, obviously it can't go this way, right? That doesn't make sense because it, it sticks over the edge of the motherboard. So it must go this way. And when we look at the pins that go to the socket that pushes down onto the 68,000, this one has a square pin right there. That is telling you that that is pin one, which is right there. There's a, there's a dot on there. The way I recall these socket things working, and they are kind of fragile and they might snap and break and then that might be the end of that, is we have to kind of bend it over on one side and then you push down like this and you give it a good old shove. This edge closer to the ramp is on all the way, but this top edge is not. So you really have to use a lot of force to get this into place. Ugh. There we go. It's on there. You just gotta kind of look down on the sides and um, yeah, it's on there. It's on there, all right. And it clears everything. Doesn't hit anything on the SE motherboard. So it completely fits. Okay, so even though it's on there, it actually looks like the very fragile plastic connector broke a little bit right here. So that kind of sucks. Yeah, those things, it's all made out of plastic and ultimately they're not designed to go on and off of chips repeatedly. So probably taking it off already kind of weakened it a little bit. 
um, but it is on there all the way. Worst case scenario on this, I don't know if this actually needs the original chip on there. I could remove the chip, remove this socket thing, and we use pin headers to actually attach this right on the motherboard. If for some reason it also needs the original 68,000, what we could do is put another socket on the top here, and I have some of those sockets that have longer pins. They go all the way through onto the motherboard. It's not ideal, but that could possibly make this work if that connector is broken. Now, one of the issues is trying to get the motherboard back into the case, and hopefully there's enough clearance with this thing clipped on there. See if I can make this happen. I think this is gonna work fine, and that's because the SE has this nice hinge design where it has these notches. So yeah, that was easy. But in a Mac SE or Mac Plus, it's really hard because you're supposed to slide the motherboard in entirely. So you have to bend this metal structure that holds the motherboard in, bend it, and use a screwdriver to wedge the whole motherboard in there. But I can see the accelerator is in there and it's not touching anything. So what I need to do is connect up the power supply and plug in the, put this like this so you can see what I'm doing. Plug in this uh, neck board for the CRT, just like that. I have a blue SCSI, which I'm gonna be plugging into the back of this thing so we can boot up this machine. Thanks very much to Joe who sent this into the basement, Joe over at Joe's Computer Museum. And I think the first thing to do is just plug this in and we'll see if this thing even powers up. If we don't get a dong or a bong or whatever it's called, then we know there's a problem. Here we go. All right, we got a beep. Good sign. I gotta grab a keyboard and mouse while this boots up. All right, well, we have a happy Mac, like it's trying to boot. Oh yeah, the blue SCSI, the light's blinking on it. So it's doing something. That's really taking a lot longer. Oh wait, it worked. I was gonna say that's way longer than it should have taken. Now, because Micromac has their website up still, I wonder if there's like drivers to install on this thing. Let me lower my chair so I can, oh. <laughs> well, let's see, is this thing even working at accelerated speeds? I don't know. We'll find out in a second. It's still loading the system here. And apologies for this, <laughs> this whole thing. <laughs> am I recording? Yes, I am. Okay. Come on. It's okay. It's, it's currently um, loading some other drives right here. That's why it's, it looks like it's hung here. It's not like a crash or anything. Yeah, the, the light's blinking on the blue SCSI. So as I was saying, um, accelerators for these classic Macs that have their own memory or caching on them, but even if they have their own SIMs, that brings a giant performance improvement. On a modern replica accelerator, you could have localized DRAM, so it wouldn't need the motherboard DRAM anymore except for the video display, because the classic Plus and SE need the local RAM. Wow, this is really slow. Like whatever's going on, the, the light's still blinking away on the thing. Oh, there we go. So is this even any faster? I'm not sure. This doesn't really feel any faster. It could just be running in, in standard 68,000 mode here. I'm running speedometer here just to do a little benchmarking, but I'm completely skeptical that this thing is actually any faster than stock. So I don't think the card is actually working right now, which is interesting because I just would have assumed if the card were bad, that it would have just crashed. The disc access feels way slower than it even should be. Actually, oh, you know what? It's already loaded. <laughs> Performance rating. Here we go. Let's run through a test here. All right, so we, I'm on the Micro Mac website here. So there's the performer. That's the card we have with the optional Mathco processor. Looks like 16 megahertz. That's what we thought. Up to 300% improvement. Optional 25 megahertz FPU. Oh, so maybe that's why they had that crystal on there. It actually runs the Mathco processor faster. Compatible system 6, 7, and 7.1. User installable. SE30 performance. It says on the Mac SE, the performer we have here is good for 300% improvement. <laughs> now on sale for $49. This is like what everyone was thinking. You could still order it. Looks like it's the same part number though. PFPL16, PF, oh no, it's not. Okay, because I guess it has that, that different uh, connector. And then there's a classic version as well. Unfortunately, look at this. Here's the, the software, which we probably need to make this work. Page not found. So that's, uh, that's unfortunate. What about this speedometer link? That doesn't work either. That's the program I'm running right now. Is uh, this actually working? Oh, it's still testing. Whoa, CPU performance should be a 1.0 and it's getting 0.051. So yeah, this machine is definitely not, not working correctly with the accelerator installed in there. 
I guess what I need to do is I need to try to find this utility here. Let's search for this. Oh boy. All right. Well, it doesn't seem like that is obviously available right off the bat. So what we need is someone hopefully has this handy. And yeah, that's the only link. Well, that's not helpful, is it? It's not even done, but something is very wrong with the system right now with this accelerator card in here. CPU speed 0.051. It should be a Mac Classic, I think. Oh no, actually, you know what? This is a newer version and a Quadra 605 is a 1.0. So that's actually, oh, and it froze. The system is frozen. Okay, well, that's, that's unfortunate. I have to power cycle the computer here. Now here's a little aside while editing. I ended up running the speedometer, the older version, and look at this. It actually shows up as a 68020, even though it's a 68030. But then running the benchmarks, the performance was worse. I know for a fact a Mac SE on this test gets a 1.0. It scores exactly the same as a Mac Classic. And clearly it's not running properly here. So I guess without the software, it's even slower. All right, well, anyhow, I think I really need the software to make this thing work perfectly or properly. And you know what? I know Max, and this is way too long for this phase of the boot up process. It should have gotten to that like within seconds on the blue SCSI on a stock SE. So something is something is the matter here. And I don't, it doesn't feel, well, SCSI feels much slower than it should be, but just moving the menus around and stuff feels stock. Like, I don't think there's any, any performance improvement happening on this machine at all. It's definitely not, 300% faster like the SE30. That is a very noticeable feel when you have an SE30 and uh, this machine does not appear to be running at full speed. But it's quite possible that without that software there, the accelerator card is not enabled until you have an extension that loads. That is totally normal. And in fact, on these classic Macintoshes, without that software, often while it's in accelerated mode, the sound gets corrupted unless the unless the software that's running on there has like a fix for it. And I know this because I made a previous video about Accelerator on Mac SE and um, the sound is all corrupted on that one too. So again, my question goes out. If anyone is aware of where to get the software for the Micro Mac accelerators, let me know. That's a weird effect. I'm just gonna turn the screen down so it stops doing that. If anyone knows where to get the software, please let me know. And don't be fooled by the fact that the website is still up, that you can still get those cards, because believe me, you cannot. And obviously those links are dead. This is just an old website that just still happens to be up and running. Let me just turn this off so you don't have to hear that fan. This uh, SE has the old squirrel cage fan, which is just very, very loud. So thanks very much for everyone who sent stuff in on mail call episodes. Sorry if I haven't gotten to it before. There's still a giant pile of stuff back there, but at least I got through three of the items today. So I'm slowly chipping away at things. Uh, huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are from upside the screen. I want to thank them for making this all possible. I do this full time because without their support, I would have to get a job and I wouldn't be able to make nearly the amount of videos that I do now, which is like two a week. Plus I do some behind the scenes stuff for my higher level patron tiers as well. So that's going to be that. Thanks again for everyone sent stuff in. And if you like this video, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. And there we go. That's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.